All right, I think we're good to go, Laura. <clears throat> okay, great. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, we're very excited to host this webinar for you and excited to have you here. We have a great panel. Uh, I will be hosting, my name is Laura Brandsias, uh, and we are lucky to have Katie Dissinger and Christy Foote. And uh, to get started, I'll just do some introductions. Um, so the first person is me. This is awkward, but I'll <laughs> introduce <laughs> myself. Um, my name's Laura Brand Sias. As I said, I, I just recently left Rutgers. I was the head coach there for 17 seasons. Uh, prior to that, I was the head coach at Fairfield University. Um, chaired some committees for the IWLCA, which for those that don't know, it's the Intercollegiate, Intercollegiate Women's Lacrosse Coaches Association. Um, and I also served on the Twarton Committee um, and was part of that selection process. So excited to be here. I'm currently the uh, center court director um, at Gillette. Um, and next we have Katie Dissinger. Uh, she is the head coach at Trinity and that is a division three college institution. She has been the head coach at Trinity for six seasons. Uh, prior to that, she was the assistant coach at Trinity. Um, she serves on the Recruiting Issues Committee and the Academic Awards Committee for the IWLCA. Uh, last but not least, we have Christy Foote. Christy is currently the director at Center Court um, for the Morristown facility. And she was most recently the offensive and recruiting coordinator at the University of Florida. Formerly was an assistant at University of Louisville, University of Notre Dame and Columbia. Um, and she's currently the head coach at Ridgewood High School as well also was a standout player um, and her and I played on the Canadian national team together, a little side note tidbit. Um, but now that we have our introductions done, um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. What we will do is if you guys have questions, you can go ahead and put those in the chat room um, and Tara who is helping us out, um, she is going to help facilitate some of those questions. We may answer some during the webinar uh, and some may be pushed towards the end, but we will do our best to get all of your questions answered. So first topic that we wanted to discuss, um, what are the differences between each event? So there's numerous events that you can attend uh, that can allow you to get recruited. So we just wanted to touch on some of the differences between what's a showcase, what's a camp, what's a tournament, and then going into either a clinic or a prospect day. Um, so Katie, if you wanted to touch a little bit on the first two, maybe talk about showcases and camps, and then Christy, you could talk about the next two bullet points. Okay, just to unmute yourself. Oh yeah. Sorry, rookie move over here. <laughs> wow, I've been on enough calls that I should know. I, I did it because I was coughing earlier. Uh, so uh, major differences would be showcase and camp. So showcase are typically off campus. So they're not usually hosted by a school. There are showcases now hosted satellite, like at a college, but not necessarily hosted by that college. So it might be an outside person going and, and running a showcase there. They're typically a bit smaller. They can have a scrimmage style play. They could have station group play. Uh, it's, it's usually slightly more intimate and there is an ability for players to speak to coaches between drills or if coaches are coaching teams and it's more of a scrimmage style for the day. Uh, difference between a camp, there's there's kind of two different camp uh, options. There's a, a overnight camps that are still very popular uh, that will be hosted often at a at a college or a university. Uh, you will definitely have time throughout the camp to speak to coaches. So that communication again with showcases and camps can you you get a little bit more interface with those coaches. Um, we can talk a little bit later about lines at the ends of camps and things like that, but those are usually the two major differences between showcases and camps. And Christy, go ahead. Yeah, going into tournaments um, and then clinic and prospect days. Um, tournaments, um, obviously with your club team, could be your high school team, bigger events, you're playing against other teams. Um, in those cases, you aren't allowed to talk to coaches. Um, there are some, you know, again, we'll talk about kind of the rules later down, but typically, you know, you're with your teams, playing with your teams, competing against other 
teams. Um, clinics and prospect days, those are usually, typically those are on campus. Um, those are good um, in the fall, a lot of, um, a lot of schools have them in the fall, prospect days, you know, after that September 1st date, um, trying to get players back on campus. It could be in the winter. Again, for Division Three, it's a little bit later. Um, but getting kids on campus, it's a shorter time period than a camp. So usually it could be two to three hours. It could be up to eight hours, but it's not days in a row. Um, you want to be prepared for those, obviously, because they're shorter amount of times. Um, you really have to go in and kick butt when you get there. Um, you don't have all day sitting around. You got to really show up, um, do your job, and make a statement. The good thing about those is they are on campus, so you'll get to meet the coaches. Um, you'll have a chance to typically the players work those events, so you'll get to meet the players and you can ask them some questions. Um, and then you might, again, smaller group, have more time to really showcase your skill sets. And one thing I'll point out as well, in the tournament setting, there are some differences between the divisions um, relative to whether or not you can talk to a coach. So uh, we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit later, but um, depending on your age, division one coaches aren't going to be able to have any interaction with you whatsoever uh, until, you know, after your junior year. Um, so there are some loopholes where once you have been dismissed at the end of a tournament, if you are in that age group where college coaches can talk to you, you can talk to a coach at the conclusion of the tournament. Um, and then division three and Katie, we can, we'll touch on this a little bit later. Mm -hmm. Division three um, can talk to you earlier than division one in that, um, in that respect. So again, we'll, we'll talk about that a little I bit later. I just wanted to add one more little point to that. Um, making sure when you do go to these camps, you do your homework. There are camps that could have up to 800 kids in them. Um, you know, for if you're trying to get recruited, you're a sophomore, you're a junior, senior, um, those camps might not be the best. Um, they are good for when you're younger, you know, um, bigger camps, get a taste of kind of, you know, what they're looking at, get a taste of campuses. Um, but just know at the end of the day, you have to know what you're working with there. Um, you know, showcases as well. I wouldn't go to a showcase not prepared. Um, Again, if you're in the eighth grade, ninth grade, um, maybe go to one or two to get kind of your feet wet a little bit. But those, again, you don't want to go and not perform well because you're not prepared um, and that may hinder your, you know, recruiting process. So really, again, showcases are for when you're ready. You want a little taste of your you're picking between a couple of schools. You want a little taste of each one of them. Um, but you, again, being prepared and ready is really important for those. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so the next topic, um, how long before an event should I contact coaches? Um, so Christy, why don't you talk a little bit about the intro and the questionnaire piece of it? Sure. Um, you know, I always, this is a big question that everyone always asks, how much should I email coaches? When should I email coaches? Um, the first thing you'd need to do if you haven't done it already is send, you know, an email to coaches, basically just introducing yourself. Um, some information, add your sports recruits or connect blacks link at the bottom so they can um, go there and see all your updated information. So you wanna make sure that's all there. Um, but it's really important to send that initial one. Um, the questionnaires, a lot of people don't know about, but basically if you go onto any website for lacrosse, they all have questionnaires. You wanna make sure that you fill those out. Um, that way you can get into their database. Um, you can get their camp information. You can get, you know, they, if they send out any newsletters, you're in there um, with their correct information. And they also know that, you know, they're interest, you're interested in them, again, by taking the time to fill those out. So those are, you know, you got to get on the radar first um, before you begin anything else. Um, and then Katie, if you just wanted to maybe talk about showcases and camps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I would say a, a timeline to work with, with camps, it, it can be up to a week in advance. Oftentimes for camps or tournaments or clinics, you're really looking at your schedule and you're trying to plan out your summer or your fall. So it is really beneficial in those introduction emails or if you know where you're going to be to just bullet point those tournaments and camps in that email. If you know that coach is gonna be at that camp, obviously, and then just the tournaments that you're going to and potential showcases 
because oftentimes coaches search by that showcase in their email and then kind of filter through from that. The questionnaire piece, I can't, you know, echo enough from Chris, what Christy said, that helps us that even if you've emailed us, letting us know a week in advance, uh, a day in advance, ideally a week in advance, a week or two, you know, trying to do those lists and filter through those emails a day before a tournament, especially a tournament is, is really difficult. I think that we could probably get 300 emails the day before a tournament and that's, that's going to be harder to get starred. But if you're already in our recruiting questionnaire system, that means you could already be a piece of our database that we're able to look at and that you've already expressed interest. So you already pop up through coach packet or for whatever uh, technology that coach is using. Um, the reason I say a week in advance is there are tons of coaches that still just write it all out. They love to write their schedule out. And so you don't want to get missed by somebody who chooses to work that way and also takes the time in advance to be able to do that. Uh, if it's a smaller... Um, Katie, can I ask you a question? Are you able yeah. as a player to go back in and update your questionnaire at any point in time? Yes. Yeah. So when you, re when you fill out a questionnaire, I haven't heard otherwise from other schools, but yes. I haven't heard otherwise from other schools, but more often than not, when you, re when you fill out a questionnaire, you should get a confirmation email. And if you just start that email, that's, that's, you know, that's your recruiting email that you're using to sign up for that. That's another really critical piece. I know parents, you're often signing your, your daughters up for your children up for tournaments and showcases and camps. Please use a lacrosse email or just one email that you're operating off of because that tends to then not match in our database when we try to pull you from the system. And so once you filled out that recruiting questionnaire, you'll get a confirmation that you're in, you've been in our system, you'll get an email and just put that in a folder and say, okay, when I have updated ACT scores, updated academics, updated things, I can go back in and I can edit it. If you have trouble with that, just go back in and fill out a new questionnaire. A lot of us merge our contacts pretty often. Um, and one thing I'll add about the tournament piece is that when you are contacting coaches about tournaments that you're attending, there's really no need to write your entire game schedule for the tournament. Um, mm -hmm. College coaches really aren't, you know, like Katie said, you're getting over 300 emails um, and college coaches really aren't going to take the time to go through and write down every game um, that people are playing in. But I will add to that, that if you are a goalkeeper, um, it is really valuable information to ask your club coaches which half you will be playing in and relay that information to um, the college coaches. I can't tell you how many times I, you know, there's so many teams that you need to see at a tournament. Um, and so you're splitting halves. You're watching one game for one half. You're watching another game for another half. And you show up for the second half at, at a game and the goalie you wanted to see already played in the first half. So, you know, specific to goalkeepers, I think that's an important piece. Um, but for everybody else, for field players, just saying that you're going to be at the tournament is enough information. We don't need the full, full game schedule. Um, so that's just one piece that I would say. And then next for clinics, obviously college coaches are going to know that you're attending the clinic because if it's on their campus, they have the roster you know, they have the sign up sheet, they know who's coming for clinics and prospect days. Um, clinics still, you know, depending on your recruiting age, if you're at the age where division one coaches, for example, can't talk to you yet, um, you can still introduce yourself at the beginning of the clinic. And I know, you know, we'll get to this a little bit later where everybody lines up at the end to say thank you and shake the coach's hand, you know, and all that. But, um, it is valuable to just give an introduction at the beginning if you can, because that puts your name and face in that coach's mind and they may pay a little bit more attention to you during that clinic uh, because you've made that connection with them right at the start rather than at the end. I can't tell you how many times, you know, if we've had a big clinic or a big prospect day where, you know, I used to meet someone at the end and say, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, do I have notes on her? Did I notice her? Um, you know, so, so try and make that introduction in the beginning if you can. Um, and then Christy, do you want to just touch on what valuable follow-up might be after some of these events? Yeah. Um, and just going back a little bit with the tournaments is there, there are such big events like that. Again, we're looking at showcases, camps and clinics. Like as a coach, I remember basically all the players that would email me before my camp clinic or, you know, showcase and I would highlight them and make sure I watch them for tournaments. You've got so many it, that it's impossible. Um, so it really is, you know, focusing on the smaller events um, and contacting coaches 
prior. Did we talk about that already? Prior? Yeah. yeah prior. Oh, well, the follow-up. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> so, it, again, tournaments is one thing, but really before showcases, camps, and clinics, the smaller amount of people, coaches can really focus on you. So make sure to send um, prior to those. Um, and then the last piece is the follow-up, which I think is really important. You know, not as much tournaments, you know, but camps, clinics, um, and showcases, really important to make you know, to respond in a more personalized way. So, you know, try to remember who coached you in what situation, um, bring in something personal. I love the drill, you know, where you, you know, you taught me to slide, to keep my stick up in the passing lane. Um, I never knew that before, you know, really loved your energy, whatever it is about each coach. Um, but really, again, as you're going to these events, taking kind of a mental note of each of the coaches, what they're kind of teaching you, one or two things from each. That way you can follow up and thank them, you know, in a more personalized sense. That's going to mean a lot more than just thank you so much um, for whatever. Um, that personal touch really goes a long way. Yeah, for sure. Katie, did you have anything you wanted to add? I, I mean, the only other piece to this, and I think we'll touch on it again with the lines and things like that later, it will really depend on your graduation year too, how that follow up and how that initial email really looks. Because if you are in ninth or 10th grade and you're emailing a division three coach or even maybe a division three two coach, the chances, the chances are, are, are probably gonna be pretty low that we'll be able to watch you at a really big tournament. But, you'll be in our email database, you'll be in our system. So that's, that's beneficial communication. It doesn't mean that it needs to happen every week or every month, but just that initial one gets you on our radar. And that's why the questionnaire going back to that is so important. Whereas we get to a camp or to a clinic and a camp and a showcase that's a little bit more intimate when you're a little bit later in your process. And like Christy said, ready to really showcase your skills and you're narrowing down your list. That follow-up email is so critical to be specific with. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, so our next topic, uh, what are the three main things coaches look for at events? Um, so I'm going to kind of, uh, I'm going to have each of you talk about these. Um, so first category with some, you know, smaller categories underneath is going to be the work ethic and attitude part of it. So Christy, if you want to kick that one off. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think that was probably work ethic, um, attitude, grit, and hustle. That is the first thing, you know, I notice when I arrive at a field. Um, one of the biggest, I think, misconceptions is that as a player, you have to be scoring all the goals all the time. You have to have the ball all the time. Um, you know, we're trained to see everything. Um, we understand the game very well. Um, we, to see a player, um, to see their passion, to see their desire to get the ball back, to see them flying all over the field, um, doing whatever it takes to get the ball, to redefend, um, to get the, the draw, you know, redefending, coming up with ground balls. It's those little things, that the first thing I notice, um, because I know that if I can get a player um, that's willing to do anything at any time, then we can teach them kind of you know, the detailed skill set later at a later time. But that's the biggest thing I see when I get to a, um, arrive at a field. Um, yeah, so I can uh, ta I can tap in right there. I would 100% agree with Christy. I, that is definitely something that I think a majority of coaches, I really believe, look for when they when they come to a field. I use this term with my team and I totally made up the word and I'm happy Laura corrected it to the correct word but <laughs> I, think I, back, I figured I'd give it to you <laughs> bounce back ability is not a word but I use it all the time with my team because it's just and with with recruits I you know lacrosse is a game of mistakes the reality is it is not a perfect it's never going to be perfect and and that's what makes it wonderful that's what makes great defense is amazing to watch it what what makes watching the ball come down and the first goal didn't go in but the second one did somebody scooped up the ball and dumped it in the net and it's really what you do after that mistake that matters so much or that perceived error uh that matters so much so what your attitude is how you're hustling to get the ball back what do you do in that next those next 10 seconds to make a difference in the game is really noticeable and oftentimes you don't have the ball at that time 
so, you know, what is that competitive drive and that, and that grit? And then a big piece definitely is athleticism. We have a shot clock now at this level. There's no denying that our game has sped up so fast over the last 10 years. I mean, I was a midi in college about to be 10 years ago, and I don't think you could pay me enough money to mid run midfield now <laughs> for 60 minutes in a game. I mean, it is moving so quick. And so the ability for you to do those footwork drills, there's so much uh, your club teams are doing, your coaches are doing, there's so much on YouTube, dodging work, uh, prevention that helps your footwork to get better and to, to be the best athlete you can be on the field, that is really going to help you as well. Uh, and then just that, that off ball work too. So we, we are trained to see the field, as Christy said, the whole field. And I do really love spatial assisters. I think every coach recognizes that we're, we want the goal scorer, but we also have to have the person next to her cutting through for her and doing it really well. Otherwise, we're never going to be able to succeed. And same defensively, if that second slide isn't there, that's, you know, that's being there for your teammate, that's doing the little things. And, and those really, really do matter. Yeah. Um, the fun, I mean, just the, touching a little bit on athleticism, there were schools I was at um, that were top schools in the country, others that um, we knew we weren't going to get the top kids. So I was trained to go to fields and look for athletes, look for players, you know, with speed, strength, footwork, eye-hand coordination, um, the right attitude, knowing that once we got them to campus, we can kind of mold them into lacrosse players. Um, and I tell this, I say this because there, there might be players out there that, you know, have focused on basketball or focused on other sports um, and aren't sure if they have a chance. Um, you know, coaches recruit for potential. They don't recruit for where you are right now, but they see something in you over, you know, the four years, it's a four year journey once you get there. So um, it's really, really important. You know, if you have that desire, that passion, you have the athleticism, um, you know, that is a huge component <clears throat> to what coaches see. Um, and then the final part is we put skill set. Um, you know, once we show up, we see the work ethic, we see the attitude, we see the athleticism. Um, the next part is really evaluating the skill set um, based on positions. Um, for example, if I go to a game and I'm looking for a feeder, um, then I kind of go more into detail. Um, is she a leader back there? Is she the quarterback? Um, is she able to assist? Is she able to dodge from back there? And you kind of have a checklist for each position. Um, so once you figure out, you know, what your role is on your team, how you best fit um, the system you're in, you know, and you can have that conversation with your coach, high school coach, club coach. Once you figure out who you are and what you bring to the team, you got to really, you know, um, hone in on those skill sets and be the best you can be at that. Um, I can't, again, I can't stress that enough because once we get down to the final decisions, it's really checking things off our checklist you know, this, 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 is she good at this, this, and you, you don't have to be perfect at everything, but what are you good at? And what are you going to bring each time you step on that field is really important to know about yourself. Yeah. And I think, a you know, a one point to say, and, and Christy, you, two of these words that, that start with a P that I think are super important. You know, I used to always tell kids like no one's expecting you to be perfect. Um, and I think so many times, you know, as a recruit, as a potential student athlete, kids put that pressure on themselves to be perfect. And as coaches, you know, we're not looking for perfection. College coaches are looking for that potential and that passion. So, you know, so many times we see kids that get so down on themselves because they made one single mistake. But like Katie said, that bounce back ability, you know, when you're not perfect, where is that passion and potential shining through and you're showing that you have, you know, you have those keys that college coaches really want. So good. Uh, so the next topic, um, how can I stand out from other players? So, um, you know, I'm going to, whoever wants to take the first one, just that BU piece. I know we talked a little bit about, you know, how people make themselves look on the field, but whoever wants to take that one. Yeah. I, I, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Christy. Go ahead. Um, no, I always just say be you, um, meaning be the best version of who you are. Um, show up to games physically, mentally, emotionally prepared um, to be the best you can be. 
Um, you can't compare yourself to other people. You can only, again, consistently look at yourself, consistently evaluate yourself, consistently get feedback um, and make changes to improve your game. Um, but, you know, don't try to be somebody else. Don't try to be this goal scorer if you're not. Don't, you know, focus in on the things that you're good at, the things that will help you shine and be the best at it. I can't stress that enough. Yeah, and, and we, we said this before, we you know, we were talking about this out. I was like, should I wear a big fluorescent like bow that's going to make me stand out? It's like, if you're not a girl who wears a bow, don't wear a bow, you know, because <laughs> college coaches, you know, if they're, they're recruiting someone who they think wears a bow and you show up on campus and, you know, that's the, that is nothing about who you are. Just be you. You know, your game is going to make you shine. It's not about what kind of gear you're wearing or if you have like the flashiest shoes or whatever it might be. It's, it's your game that you want to focus on. Yeah, I had said on our on our call, I was like, if you wear if you want to wear the bow, go ahead and wear the bow if that's who you are. Yeah. It, it'll help the coach know. And I believe Lauren Taylor in the background over there might have worn a bow in her heyday. Um, <laughs> but you know, and to the second bullet there, it goes with being yourself, but attitude and engagement. I think, you know, that really comes down to how you're engaging with your teammates on the sidelines. So thinking tournament play. We definitely watch how you stand on the sidelines, how you come off the field. If you talk to your coach, if you talk to your teammates, if you engage with them, you don't have to be the loudest person on the sidelines by any means, because that's not everybody. But, you know, how are you coming off the field and engaging with those around you and especially your coach? Uh, and then engagement at clinics and showcases where it's a little bit of a more intimate environment I think that's where it can really come through that attitude is so important making eye contact uh, staying engaged and just being present and enjoying it and I often believe that coaches can really see the people that have a love for the game and are are really excited about being there and I think that takes a little bit of self-reflection too making sure if you're at a camp at a at a school that you just, it wasn't clicking, then, then that may not be the right place for you, but you're at a clinic where you're really engaged and you're showing this awesome attitude and you, you're really feeling the place, it's, it's going to come through. Uh, and then I'm a big be creative person because I do truly believe lacrosse is so creative. So kind of going to Christy's point of being you, try things out there and, and show your creativity. And again, those risks, can be good risks. They're not going to define you as a player. We are again looking for that potential. So take th those creative moments and be a leader on the field when you have the opportunity to, or if you're in a smaller drill at a clinic, that's a really good chance to show that side and ask those questions as well. Um, and I don't know, if, I mean, the being yeah. a good teammate piece, Christy, if you want to go there. Yeah. No, I, I just like the last part of it is, you know, I would say do all the little things both on and off the field um, to stand out from other people. Um, I think too many times people underestimate the, the power of the little plays. Um, I said this before, but coaches see everything and they want those players that are going to go above and beyond to do, you know, to get that ground ball when it matters, um, to run it out, to hustle it out, fly, it, you know, be all over the place, um, do the little things when you can on the field and then off the field, be a good person, be a good teammate, um, you know, say please, play, say thank you, respect your coaches and parents, um, speak res respectfully to your teammates, um, offer to help your coaches, offer to help your teammates, um, do what you say you're going to do, and, you know, coaches talk to club and high school coaches all the time, and the first thing they ask is, how is she as a person, first and foremost, um, that matters and I think a lot of times players are like I'm just a lacrosse player no you're you know being the best person um translates to being the best player you can on the field um I don't think in my opinion they're not two separate entities being a good person um will help you be a better player on the field um, one, oh. sorry I was just going to add to that and one yeah, thing that people may not think about is just that you know officials as well you know, how you treat officials is a big piece of it. And a lot of these officials that um, are working these events or are working your high school games, they're also carrying over and working some of these college games. And college coaches have relationships with officials. You know, they, they do talk to them or those, those officials may ref their practices. And there's definitely times where an official may say, 
um, you know, this, this kid really has an attitude on the field or they constantly talk back to me, you know, they treat all the officials poorly. Um, you know, so really the simple point is that you just want to show that you're a good person. You know, there should never be a doubt about the kind of person that you are and the kind of person that you want to portray yourself. And that should just go across the board. Um, one quick piece that I wanted to add about showcasing your skill set, and Christy touched on this in, in the last topic, but when you are at um, you know, clinics and prospect days or camps where you are working with coaches specifically, it's worth asking, and you can ask these questions, you can say, hey, you know, where do you see me on the field? Like after you've been going through a few drills or you've gone been there, you know, for a couple of days, if it's an overnight camp. Um, because you may be a midfielder, but that college coach really sees, you know, potential in your defensive skill, um, you know, or they see potential in your attacking skills as opposed to your midfield skill. And it may be beneficial for you if you're really interested in that school and, you know, flipping the switch and only focusing, really focusing on that skill where they see you rather than diluting what you're bringing to the table. You know, you're really able to showcase one specific set of skills that they're noticing you for. Um, that may, that won't change what you, you know, do for your club program or your high school program. Um, you know, but, but those are conversations that club and high school coaches have with college coaches. They'll say, Hey, listen, she's a midi for me, but I really think in college, she'd be a standout defender. Um, you know, so those conversations are, are definitely happening. Katie, did you have something you wanted to add? You, you probably, I touched on it with the officials actually. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it was perfect. Okay, great. Um, okay, so um, what role should parents play at events? Uh, so Katie, do you wanna take this first one? I'd be happy to with a former parent sitting on the call. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I really truly believe that coaches, every, almost every coach out there that I know is recognizing to an extent that we recruit a family when we recruit a player. And many of us may go about this in different ways where some are way more engaging throughout the process with the entire family than some others. Uh, and every coach has their style with that. But I do really, you know, that is a topic of conversation while coaches are on the sidelines as we are watching the parents as well. And and I've definitely, you know, had, we've had our fair share of comments that you make your head turn and you just don't, you know, you want to just watch what you're saying in those moments. And obviously you've all afforded uh, your children to have this incredible experience. Uh, we just want it to be really positive for them. Uh, I think that it's really important to instill for us, what we say to our players translates all the way to the sidelines. And that includes parents, family, friends, spectators, you know, you want to be a proud viewer and just be super supportive. Uh, you've, you know, had conversations, you know, there's no, no player loves to go to that, that grab that snack after a game and hear like, oh, you wish you could have gotten that shot. And, you know, they already know they're already really hard on themselves. And I think just as much support and love as you all know to show uh, would be amazing. And just the, the impression you create is definitely there. The more vocal parents definitely get noticed. Uh, definitely, again, something that we talk about with club coaches and high school coaches a lot is families because we want your daughter to have an amazing four-year experience and we want the family to have one as well but we wanna make sure it's a positive environment. Uh, and oftentimes we ask, you know, the opinion to coaches and club coaches of families more often than not. Yeah. I don't know if Chris, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, I mean, one thing we used to tell, you know, our parents and our players was, you know, for families, your daughter's away at school. Um, she calls you after practice. She's had a bad practice. You know, you're the one she's going to complain and, you know, let loose and vent. Um, I think, you know, after time, if you start to see, you know, your, your daughter's really struggling, you know, then you encourage her to go talk to her coaches. I think a lot of times, um, in, you know, you, you have to understand, like, coaches are people. They want the best for their teams. They care about them so much. Um, 
that you really have to send them back to your coaches, go talk to your coach about this. Um, you know, go see what she thinks. Um, a lot of times, you know, players just are scared or they, you know, don't feel comfortable. Um, and then, you know, that opportunity is lost. And then, the, you know, the upsetness, the anger keeps building and building and building when it can be solved right away. Um, so that communication part, you know, you care about your daughter, but understand she's going to have a lot of bad days and you're the one she's going to call. Um, but just send her back to your coaches and be as supportive as possible. Um, those conversations are, I can't tell you how many, you know, once players started to do that, the culture of the parents starts to change. They start to understand. They see that you don't, you know, they see that coaches aren't just these evil people that don't play your daughter. They really do care about every single player and they would do anything for any of them. Um, and even though she may not be playing as much as you want her to, you know, she does mean something to the team and the coaches and you gotta just remember that and keep sending them back to their coaches to communicate. And, and the reality is that at the high school level, they're, they're probably playing most likely and on club teams on smaller rosters. I mean, they're just gonna get onto a larger roster when they get to college so that battle and that adversity is going to be another chapter of their lives that they'll face and so I think if that conversation starts early and often when they're freshmen then by the time that they get to play at the collegiate level they know like Christy said to say okay well have you talked to coach have you talked to your assistant coach have you talked to the captains before you know really uh putting themselves in it and I think parents can have a really healthy relationship um, mm -hmm. with each other and have like a really good network. Um, it's like you re relive your college days, you know, going through the four years with your daughter. So, um, you know, really use it as a positive um, tool for your family and to meet people and to really enjoy it because it does go fast and, um, you know, tough things do happen, but they're all things you can get through um, with positivity and, you know, communication and kind of putting things, you know, into perspective. And a, a hard piece to put in perspective, like Christy was saying, for so many people is that the actual, like playing the sport of lacrosse is such a small fraction of time, you know, in the grand scheme of what, you know, you're getting as a collegiate student athlete, not only from your coaches, but from support staff and, and, you know, the overall experience in general. So you really want to make sure that, you know, your daughters have a healthy perspective when it comes to playing time and practice time so that they're making the most of those moments and, and not having any negativity that might, you know, fester from, from that takeaway from all the other amazing things that they're also being exposed to. Ladies, we have a question in our Q&A. Um, I was wondering, what is a typical roster size? So it varies. Go ahead, Laura. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say the same thing. It really varies, um, and I think that's a really, really good question, and it's a really good piece for you to do during your research when you're looking at schools. Um, not only to look at the roster size, but to also go into uh, the team stats and see how many people typically play in a game because there are some coaches who, you know, we'll call them old school. And that's just because that's what <laughs> people say, but whatever, um, you know, that may not play a lot of kids, but they have a huge roster. You know, I came from the world of Big Ten and the Big Ten travel roster was 40. So, you know, that's a huge roster when you're talking about only 12 players being on the field at any given time. But if you look at, you know, one team that constantly runs midfield lines and they're a high pressure running type of team, well, they're playing a lot of kids, um, you know, but if you look at another team that has a really big roster, but they're only playing 14, 15 kids a game, you know, what, what are your chances really going to be, you know, to get on the field there? And are you willing to have an experience that potentially may not have you on the field? So, you know, and then, it ver I mean, it goes depending on the level that you're looking at, the division that you're looking at, it, it's going to be all over the place. Um, so. Yeah. And it's changed a lot in the last five years, again, because of the rule changes, coaches did make a push to bring in uh, larger rosters to keep up with the speed of the game. But that also means that there's less of some of that old school 
quote unquote, uh, you know, non subbing the middies for 16 minutes that mm -hmm. they are running an AMIT, an AMIT or a DMIT or out of the box. And, and that will continue to develop. Uh, so every coach's coaching style, it's a great question to ask a coach of a program as you start to narrow down the school and, right. and as you watch their games. Yeah. And I, I see the question. I can answer it if you want right here. That says, how can you tell if the college you are looking at is recruiting your position, for example, goalies? I would look at their roster, first of all, and see what year their goalies are. Some coaches do like bringing in a goalie two years in a row or every other year, and some have different philosophies on that. And then I would just really ask straight, straight up, just yeah. say, are you recruiting a goalie? How many defenders, middies, and attackers are you looking for in this class? And while I think those positional questions exclusive of the goalie, the goalie is a very specific one, the other one could really range in answers in the sense that, again, you may have been recruited as a midi, but all of a sudden you're a defender. So that, that's not really so set in stone at times unless there's a high, high need, high priority that they know in two years they're graduating three players in that position that are really impact players and they need to you know, groom them or have some underclassmen coming under them. So it's not always going to be super black and white with the rest of the positions other than goalie. Yeah, and if, if you're in an age group where you're not able to you know, have conversations with those college coaches yet, that's where you really wanna hit up your club coaches and your high school coaches because they can reach out to those schools and ask those questions for you. So good. Okay. Um, so next topic, when should I introduce myself to coaches? Uh, and we're going to have Christy touch on the D one situations. And then Katie's going to touch on the D three, cause there are some definitely some differences. Yeah. I mean, um, D one situation. So September 1st of your junior year is the, for division one, basically, um, when you can talk to coaches and they can communicate back to you. Um, that really starts the process. Um, after that, um, so when should I, sorry, I was skipping the question. When should I introduce myself to coaches? Um, again, like we talked about, um, tournaments, no, not a good time. Coaches are busy. They have to get places. They got to do things. If you see them in passing, say hi. They could say hi, perfect, awesome, no big deal. Um, but they're not going to stop and have conversations um, to go with you. Um, on campus, you know, again, that's, they want you to come to campus division one coaches so they can talk to you and they can show you around and they can, um, you know, that's when the recruiting process does start after September 1st of that, of your junior year. So <laughs> on campus, um, awesome, cool. Um, and then showcases, if, typically if they're off campus, again, you can ask some questions, you can kind of introduce yourself in between drills um, and, you know, prior, after that's all good. Um, but they can't really, again, go out of their way and have a full blown conversation. Off campus contact, very different than on campus contact. Yep, so D division three is uh, the wild west. So we, we, we pretty much have no rules. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have the capacity nor are we talking to any freshmen? I'm sorry for freshmen on this webinar right now, but um, they, you know, there is no restrictions on texting, phone calls, email, contact, on-campus visits, talking to them on campus. I, I, I'm specific with that of any graduation year. I think what you have to realize that this level is the division three is ranges very large from the top school in the country division three wise and the ability with their staff and their assistants to some of the maybe potentially un, un, less funded programs that share an assistant. So the capacity for a coach to be able to be responding to emails to a sophomore may be a little bit different. I'd say we really start that sophomore year to build that relationship to coming into their junior year. And with regards to physical introductions, Visits on campus are 100% encouraged, and it could be something where you come and take a tour, do an info session. But some coaches are going to be more for or against meeting with somebody that's potentially a first year or a sophomore. So it will depend coach to coach on whether they meet with you face to face for five minutes, 10 minutes, longer than that, or if they have their assistant doing that. So it will really depend 
again, a week's head notice, heads up is really helpful with that if you're making that type of visit. And then we actually can uh, talk to you after you're done competing for the day at a tournament or a camp or a clinic off campus. Uh, that can happen after your sophomore year, so into your junior year. Um, I had a brain freeze for a second, <laughs> junior year. And what I'd say, similar to Christie's tournaments, it, it is it is so, we're, we're getting from field one to 37 because somehow we mixed up our schedule and we have to walk a mile and a half. It, it is a little hard at tournaments, but I'd say at camps and clinics, that's a really reasonable place in between drills to say, thank you so much coach for coaching that drill. This is my name. It was awesome to learn about that, you know, 5v4 man up drill and, and kind of say your name and move on. So those are permitted. Again, phone calls and texts are as well. I just would say until you're into your junior year, that's most likely not happening. Um, What's the July 1st date then for Division 3? Oh, yeah. Yep, sorry, thank you. Uh, for uh, That's not really contact-based. That's more offer-based for academics. So that's more of an offer date. So Jan starting January 1st of your junior year, every other Division three school in the country except for the NESCAC, which is the New England Small College Athletic Con Conference. It consists of 11 schools. I would go through and list them all, but you can definitely go and Google it <laughs> off the top of my head. Uh, Trinity is one of them. Uh, January 1st of your junior year, every other Division three school can do an overnight, an official overnight on campus. NESCAC schools are not allowed to do an overnight until September 1st of your senior year. So oftentimes, players are making a decision about where they want to go to college with a day official visit, but not an overnight visit. And July 1st is the offer, academic offer of support date for NESCACs, and January 1st is the academic offer date for every other Division three school. Okay. <laughs> um, so just heading into our question section, I'm just seeing here, we do have a few questions about how COVID-19 will affect the recruiting process. Um, you know, some just overall questions and then some specific to the recruitment of the high school classes of 21, 22, and 23. Um, you know, I can touch on this overall and then Katie and Christy, you guys can, can put your two cents in. I do think that, you know, we wish there was a blanket answer to this, but there isn't one. Uh, you know, as, as much uncertainty as there is with this whole situation, there also is with, you know, the college landscape and, and the recruiting process. And I think it's really going to vary from school to school. I do think that once everyone heard that, you know, the NCAA was, was giving people a year of eligibility back, this big uproar happened, uh, which is completely understandable. But I think there are so many factors that go into the decision to stay in college for an extra year. Um, you know, and for those, those current players that are seniors, um, you know, if you're on pace to graduate and you find out midway through the spring of your senior year, hey, you can stay for another year. That's not exactly the easiest decision to make. So I think everyone thought that there was going to be this flood of players that were going to stay. Um, you know, but you have to think about your own personal situation. If, if you know, if your daughter was a senior in college and, and right now, you know, during this COVID-19 pandemic and how many people are, are out of work right now and the financial situation for so many people, could you afford to stay in college, have your daughter stay in college for another year and forego entering, you know, the job market? Um, you know, so that's a big decision for people. There's a big decision, big decisions at play for college coaches as well. Uh, you know, did that, can they afford to keep kids um, on their team. And that goes back to that roster size. You know, you've already know you're having this incoming freshman class come in. Is keeping seniors for that year really part of the formula and something that you can do and manage your, you know, manage your budget, um, you know, and, and any scholarship opportunities that you may have. And just one side note, division one can offer athletic scholarships, division three cannot offer athletic scholarships. Um, you know, so division three, you're working more along the lines of, um, you know, financial aid and things like that. So 
it, it's going to vary from school to school, um, you know, and, and how it's going to affect, uh, you know, recruiting class sizes. I do think, especially for the 2022 class, uh, the timeline is going to be a lot different this year than it has been in recent years. Um, we don't quite know yet how it's going to affect the 23s. I think a lot of that is going to play out as we see how the fall goes and, you know, hoping that this effect doesn't last past the fall, um, you know, then we'll know more about the 23 class, but I think the 22 class just needs to be ready to, to be patient and understand that this process universally across the board for every single 2022 recruit and every single college coach in the country is going to be different this year. Um, you know, so we just hope that everyone's able to take a deep breath and, and not get too, too stressed out about this. Um, you know, so that's, that's what I would say. And, and Katie and Christy, if you have more to add to that, especially Katie being, being in the thick of it, you know, as a college coach right now. Yeah. I, I mean, one piece to the scholarship extensions, I, I can't talk too much about Christy might be able to touch on what her thoughts are on the back end of that. There are no athletic scholarships at division three only academic or merit-based. So that won't be an issue. Obviously a financial aid package could probably, could potentially be if, you know, that being able to match that the next year. I haven't heard too much about returning seniors. There's been a couple here and there across our league considering it potentially. And in the greater scheme um, of the division three, we did do a, a poll to try to get a sense of that, but I don't know that it will heavily affect, it may knock one person off of a class, but I don't think it will have as much of an effect as it will with scholarship being moved around at the division one level. Um, and then I think, you know, in the midst of, of, of COVID, I, you know, the one piece of advice I've been giving right now to 22s is saying, unfortunately, but also fortunately, this makes you take a much harder, harder look at the school that you might be interested in before you get the opportunity to just go to a camp, go to a clinic, go and visit, go and see it. And obviously this summer is, is a really hard pill for all of us to swallow, but it is a, re, a kind of opportunity to, to try to see the silver lining of, okay, let's do all our due diligence to really figure out what my list of schools really looks like and then dive in really head first on what is the best fit for me. And maybe casting that net a little smaller than you would have in the past where you might have the opportunity to jump around a lot. And it just gives you a little bit more taking that opportunity to have some, some self-reflection of saying, okay, what is the right place for me versus, okay, this, email, this coach just emailed me. Maybe I should look there. You know, what, what is the right whole fit academically, athletically, extracurricularly, what you want to do post-college, if that's something you even know right now, uh, how, you know, how can I create a list that looks really compact and then just really dive into that type of communication? Uh, I don't know for the scholarship piece. Yeah, as far, yeah, no, as far as scholarship, I mean, you know, in talking and looking about, you know, Furman men's lacrosse just canceled you know, took away their season, there, there's going to be a huge financial impact across the country. Um, and we don't know what that's going to look like right now. Do I think it will impact um, schools? Yes, 100%, not every single school, but it will have a, an impact. You know, there will be cuts. If we don't have football, if football and basketball aren't going on, um, there, there's going to be huge implications. So it is something to think about. Um, but again, with the so many unknowns, it's not something you can control. And that's, you know, what you have to continue to remind yourself is that, what can I control? When we come out of these 10, 11, 12 weeks, whatever in quarantine, coaches are going to be able to tell who has put in the work over this time. There's going to be a huge, huge difference in those players that have put in the work and those players that have sat around and complained and not done anything. Um, so it goes back to controlling what you can control. Yes, there's going to be some implications. We don't know them yet. That's not something we can answer. But what can you do? Because when you're back on that field, you have the opportunity to become a completely different player and change that for yourself. Um, and you got to look at the things you can control, in my opinion. Yeah. And to Christy's point, I mean, it's almost like football training for, for 
women's lacrosse players right now, they train non-contact for so long to then go back to contact. So hone in on those skills, like get creative, have fun, master a new skill. And that, that will come out in your confidence when you have the opportunity and, and we'll feel all so grateful to be able to see the field again. Um, so just a couple, couple more questions that we have here. Um, one is are most D one college programs fully funded. What is the biggest difference between the upper level D three programs and the lower D one programs? Um, so relative to, you know, division one programs and how they are financed, uh, there, I wouldn't say that most college programs are fully funded. I think you would be really surprised at the programs that aren't fully funded. Um, and for those, you know, just an education piece, what fully funded means is that that school funds 12.0 scholarships at any given time. So, you know, to, to go back a little bit where I'm talking about, you know, my experience, I came from a big 10 program where the travel roster was 40. If you think about that, you got 40 kids on a team and you can only use 12.0 scholarships. That's the maximum amount of scholarships that you can have out at any given time. Um, so you don't get 12 new ones every year. You're managing 12 scholarships at any given time. Uh, so financially, you know, you hear so many times people tell stories of, you know, so-and-so got a scholarship to go play lacrosse at this full school, this school mm -hmm. and everyone just, full assumes, ride, yeah. yeah, that it's a full ride. And I mean, those are like unicorns in the process. Yeah. Like, you know, I shouldn't say unicorns because there are some, you know, that, that happen, um, but it's not the norm by any means. You're more so going to see you know, scholarships getting chopped up where, you know, you're getting 25% or 30% or 40%, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so those are really important questions to have throughout the recruiting process, you know, but to also manage expectations and understand that, you know, it's lacrosse is an equivalency sport where college coaches at the division one level can chop the money up that they have for scholarships any way they choose. Um, you know, sports like basketball and football are headcount sports where they are given a certain number of scholarships and every kid that's on scholarship gets a full ride. Um, you know, so there's, there's a drastic difference in that. So if a kid goes to play for football or basketball and they are on a division one scholarship, yes, they are getting a full ride. Um, but for equivalency sports like field hockey, soccer, um, you know, lacrosse, it, they're getting something, um, but more than likely it is not a full ride. So, you know, and, and to touch on Christy's point, like this is going to have a huge financial impact. Um, so coming out of this, there may be some schools that, you know, that aren't fully funded after this whole process comes through, um, you know, and they're going to have to make some decisions. So again, it's going to be on a case by case basis. And, you know, that's going to be a really important question to ask or to have your club or high school coaches kind of dive into a little bit um, to, to get some of those answers. And then Katie, you can you touched on the D3 piece. So. Yeah. And, and the difference, I think the second part to that was the difference between high division three and, and division one. Yeah. Lower oh, division one. Lower division one. I mean, there obviously there's an athletic scholarship piece to that. Uh, you know, but I would say probably one of the largest differences, there's not a lot of difference sometimes in playing style. There's going to be a lot of top 10 ranked division three teams that, that could beat a lower division one team, but you know, it is about the experience that you want. And that, that goes back to looking at finding your fit. And, and this is what I just, I say to players is I say, you have to do a little self-reflection. You have to say, okay, am I the type of player that I have to have my coach with me all year long, telling me what to do, keeping me on track. And there's no harm in that. That's just, that is your mentality. And that keeps you on your schedule and that keeps you going. Or do you want to go abroad your fall of your junior year? Or do you want to play two sports? I mean, we, there's plenty of top 10 division three teams that have won national championships with multiple two sport athletes on them that, that is incredible that they can still do that and manage that. It's obviously different school to school, coach to coach, their preference, and you have to find that fit. But I think you do have to do a self-assessment of what type of experience do I want? Do I want to do that internship in the fall? What type of academic flexibility do I have at a, a lower D1 school, which some do have a lot of that academic flexibility. And then, 
you know, what type of competition do you want? Do you want to be fighting for that conference championship or is this school the right academic fit for you? So there's a lot of pieces as you start to visit schools and, and do the virtual tours right now, you know, starting to make your kind of non-negotiables list of things that you you really want out of your college experience and then you'll start to really be able to tailor that difference but playing wise there's there's not too much difference although yeah if I can't say sure um so one quick question are there any showcases you recommend and think that are better than others you know I think that that depends on on where your interest lies and what schools you want to be seen by um you really just want to do the research to see what schools are going to be at those showcases what those showcases offer. Um, I don't think we can say that there's any that are better than others. It's, it's gonna be you know, your personal preference. And that's something that your high school and your club coaches can really help you with, um, given the type of player that you are, where your interests lie. Um, so that's more of a you know, case by case personal, personal situation. Um, and then the one last one we have is, uh, what is our advice to a potential recruit and do you use social media in recruiting your players? Um, so Christy, do you want to touch on that one? Yeah, I think social media can be a huge benefit or it could be a huge downfall and you, you can decide, you know, how to go about that. Um, I, again, right now coaches are on their phones a lot. They're on the computers a lot. They're checking social media. Um, they actually have time to watch videos. They actually have time you know, to check their Instagram out. So, you know, if you're highlighting yourself in the best possible light, it's a great tool. Um, you know, there's, there's been cases where, you know, players are posting negative things or, you know, and it's just different situations. You got to really be careful what you post. And I, I tell our players all the time, um, you know, it, it, it's just not worth it. You know, college coaches do look at every little detail and if they're deciding between you and another player and there's something on your social media that separates you in a positive or ne negative way that can make a difference in your decision to go, uh, go to a school or not so be careful you know be smart don't post anything that you wouldn't want a potential employee employer a future employer to not hire you because of um you know but can you use it as a tool to highlight yourself? 100%. Um, that's the best thing you can do at this point in time. Katie, you want to add to that? Uh, absolutely. I, I agree with the social media piece. I am trolling Instagram. I've never looked at Instagram more in my life than I have in the last four weeks. And not because I want to, trust me. Uh, but, you know, they, I, I think that there's coaches that really do dive into that piece of it and it can be really valuable. You know, those, the public accounts are just really clean ways to see who you are as a person or, or if you follow a program and you have a Visco and it's really, again, your grandmother would approve of it. You know, that is, that is a great way during COVID-19 for us to get to almost know you a little bit via via your personality and what you're willing to post and what you're willing to put out there. You just have to be really careful. Uh, for, for a recruiting tool, I think programs actively use Instagram uh, to promote their program. That's a great way to follow a program, to get to know a program, to do the, see the takeovers, see what they've posted, see what they're highlighting about their players. But then, you know, I feel as though football and basketball use Twitter more, women's lacrosse is not really in that world, I'd say. I think they're probably stronger in the Instagram world and Facebook, but uh, I'd say it can be a useful tool if you use it correctly as well. And then just, just cleaning stuff up. You have some time right now, go through and delete what you don't want. <laughs> and, and, and if grandma's there, have grandma tell you what she shouldn't, you shouldn't have up there. So uh, I think that that's, it can be definitely useful. And then the advice right now would be to just be as creative as possible with what the hand we've been dealt and, and to try to foster your love for the sport, watch film. If you're looking at different schools, you know, ESPN, you just played all the national championships from the last couple of years on TV. What an awesome way to increase our, your IQ than to watch that. And that's such a fun way to watch that live. Go back, 
there's archives on college websites. If there's a college you're seriously interested in, they often can have a game on their archives of their college websites and say, all right, this is their style of play. This is what the, how they look. So, so use it all to your advantage right now. Yeah, and one quick point um, on the social media piece too is just a suggestion is you can, you know, if you want to keep your personal account private, you can make a separate um, lacrosse recruiting account, uh, you know, and have your name on it and your, re your recruiting year, especially during this time. That's a great way to post, you know, you doing some shooting drills, some footwork drills, wall ball, whatever it may be, something that displays, you know, a quirk in your personality. Um, you know, we joked the other day that we saw a kid's video and I was like, Hey, that tells me that she would be a really good time on bus trips. Like that's something that we would love to see. So, you know, you, you can have both and certainly you should, you know, you should be cleaning up your personal Instagram. Um, but it can be beneficial also to have, you know, a lacrosse specific Instagram, especially during this time when, you know, as, as Katie said, coaches are really trolling Instagram hardcore right now. So, um, but, uh, you know, we don't have any more questions posted. Um, so I think we're going to wrap this up, but, you know, really want to thank our panelists. Um, thank coach Dissinger, coach foot, um, Tara, thank you for keeping us on track. Um, and you know, really an honor for us to talk to you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like uh, to just add two quick points. If everyone wants to look at our Instagram, um, at Center Court 360. We have um, also on our website, which is um, uh, centercourtacademy.com. The 360 program, we actually offer classes on social media and how to curate your professional and athletic way to recruit. So there's, there's a lot of good stuff. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, enjoy the rest of your night. Bye, guys. Bye. Thanks.